How much? Okay, okay. Um, disclaimer, before we start this discussion, it's essential to know that we're talking about a very heavy topic. Um, the flyer probably gave that away. So it's related to um, suicide and mental health. We acknowledge that these topics can be quite heavy and can also evoke some triggering thoughts or distressing thoughts for some listeners. So if you or someone you know needs immediate support or guidance, please seek mental help um, and helplines in your areas. Your well-being is very important and we urge you to prioritize that self-care throughout this conversation. Welcome to the Multiple Podcast. My name is Mo. I am the host of this podcast and today we'll be talking about suicide, especially how to safeguard preteens from suicide. According to the World Health Organization, suicide rights are the second leading cause of death among those that are aged between 15 and 24 years globally. So today we're diving into this crucial topic with a panel of experts um, dedicated to understanding and on the, on addressing this um, pervasive issue among today's youth. And um, our distinguished panels, they bring a combined wealth of experience and expertise, both personally and pro professionally. Um, so as we discuss this, we'll tease out some tips that will be helpful for not just the individuals who may be at risk, but also their loved ones, so their guardians, their parents, friends, teachers. So it's going to be very, very um, um, all-encompassing. Our very first panelist I'd like to um, introduce is Jessica Piri, originally Nigerian. She's a wife, a sister, and a daughter, and a wonderful friend of mine. She received a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Loyola University, a Master of Public Health from DePaul University, and doctoral degree from Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. She's an instructor of public health at Northwestern University and DePaul University. She's also a content writer for Kuth a global mental app, mental health app, sorry. Her research interests are in health equity, mental health, and advanced childhood experiences, which we'll call ACEs. And she's also particularly interested in gender-based violence and female genital mutilation and cutting, which if you've listened to this uh, podcast a lot, you, you know she's, she's not new to the podcast. As a lecturer and writer, she enjoys simplifying complex topics and making uncomfortable subjects into conversational pieces for any audience. Um, our next panelist I'd like to um, introduce is Doc Ayamide. Um, you've known him a lot on the podcast. He used to serve as a one-time co-host as well. He's a wonderful old friend of mine, and he's a writer and a psychiatrist who spent over a decade thinking, writing, and speaking about what it means to be human through the lenses of behavioral psychology, culture, and faith. He has been featured on various Nigerian radio and TV stations on international media, including HuffPost, and he's been invited to speak at the TEDx. He had his medical and psychiatric training in Nigeria and now lives and works in the UK. He enjoys reading fantasy fiction and theology texts. You can say hello to him on Twitter or shoot him an email on hello at docayomide.com. Last but not the least is Dr. Mathero Michelle Nkalamba. She's a native of Malawi. She grew up in Elongwe, which is the country's capital, alongside her seven siblings. She pursued her education in psychology, obtaining the Bachelor of Arts in Humanities from the University of Malawi, an MSc in clinical psychology from Bangor University in UK, and a PhD from Rhodes University supported by the Bates Trust Scholarship. So the Bates is similar to a Rhodes Scholarship, but it's really mostly for those in um, I think, um, Zambia and maybe Malawi. Um, she also specializes in global health, mental health, uh, by focusing on preventive mental health approaches. She provides psychological support, psychosocial support, in high-risk settings and employs what we call cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT alongside other methods. She ensures ethical research practices through her involvement within Malawi National Commission for Science and Technology. And she explores topics like HIV and mental health. She's dedicated to advancing mental well-being and ethical research standard as a, a shattered psychologist and registered clinical psychologist. As you can see, all these people are very loaded, you know, both professionally and personally. So please, everyone, join me in giving a warm welcome to our esteemed panelists. And thank you so much to have you on the show. It's such an honor. All right, um, I guess let's just start with Jessica. Um, you you kickstart this as a pace setter because I remember, and I should also say thank you because you inspired this um, conversation. If you recall when you came on the podcast, you briefly touched on it and I was like, wait, what? I did not know that about her. You had yeah. shared um, on one of your episodes that at eight, you attempted suicide. And I won't like to, you kind of took me about because not that you can ever, ever predict anyone who is at risk of suicide, right? But um, just hearing your story and seeing how you've you know made so much out of your life, it really, really um, 
it was very inspirational to hear that. And I thought it could be a time to kind of expand on that. So um, can you share your story and, you know, basically maybe tell us a little bit about your family background? What, what led on to that incident and what was your family response to that? Thank you so much for having me here. It means a lot. Um, I was reflecting or reflecting on um, just that time of life and thinking about the fact that we're approaching the holidays. So this is just so incredibly timely because um, we, I, I don't know what it looks like in the rest of the world, but in the part of the world that I'm in right now in the U.S., um, suicide rates across the different ages are typically very high <laughs> around this time. So I'm so glad that we get to talk about this now. Um, so I was born and raised in Nigeria. I am a Northern girl through and through. Um, I, uh, oof, let me, when I was, I talked to my parents about this, actually, I was telling them a few days ago, um, it's like, you know what, I am about to share all of this, you know, a bit more extensively publicly. I think you should know some of the details. Or right, so we talked about it and they were undoubtedly surprised, right? Um, and my dad's first question was, where was I? You know, like, wait, I don't understand. Where was I? Um, which I really appreciate that because I realized he and my mom were asking that, but they were asking it not just physically, where were we, but like mentally and emotionally, where were we? How did we miss this? Um, which speaks a lot to what was happening at the time. So um, I am the oldest of three daughters. Um, I grew up always hearing, never from my parents or from other people around us, that our family was not complete. Like we needed a son, we had a son. Um, it was very normal for uh, fathers to show up with a new wife so that she can produce sons for him if the first doesn't. So um, there was already this natural pressure that came with being the firstborn because I felt I'm the daughter and the son. I need to carry on as much as as I can to make my family proud. In fact, the first time I saw Mulan, I like of all the Disney princesses, I related the most. I was like, she she's doing what she has to do to bring honor to her family. I was like, I don't see the problem. <laughs> so the idea of honor and carrying, um, you know, and, and uh, not not disappointing your parents was very much part of the rhetoric. Every Nigerian movie would tell you, yeah, don't disgrace me, don't disgrace me. So uh, it was very much part of the rhetoric then. Um, I have very educated parents who were flawed, but did their very best. And part of doing their best was my dad was away a lot for work. And so my mom took more uh, more of uh, the child rearing. And out of her frustration and all of that, she would hit me. And she realizes it now, and, and back the sheet, but she admitted to me a few years ago, she was like, that was child abuse. I'm like, yes, it was. Um, which is a big deal for, for an Nigerian mom to admit, but it was, <laughs> and yes. Um, so there was that, like, so I was, I was living in fear. Um, I was constantly, you know, trying to manage expectations and, and all of that because I would be whooped for the littlest things. Um, and I remember asking my mom one time if there was anything I could ever do to make her happy. Cause I felt like whatever I did would, you know, trigger some kind of negative response. Um, she, when, when we were talking about this a few days ago, she was like, yeah, I actually remember you asking me if you needed to pass all your exams for me to love you. Um, and, you know, for her, it was like, well, no, obviously not, it's fine. But, but I was, it was my way of uh, trying to gauge, like, what do I have to do to be hit less? What do I have to do to receive love? Um, at the same time, you know, I'm like watching these movies and seeing parents hug their children and talk to their children, but I wasn't getting any of that. Um, and so all of that kind of started to build into this, man, I can't do anything right. Um, and at some point it was the like these like whispers in my head that were like, well, if I'm not here, then things would just be easier for everyone because I just seem to be irritating everyone, you know, Um I seem to not be enough. So my dad is not staying around. He needs to go somewhere else to work or he seems to enjoy his work better. And my mom is just so tired of us and, and all of that. So um, all of those things were building into uh, the, the feeling of just not feeling enough and not feeling like I was uh, wanted or loved or like I was supposed to be here. Um, we lived in, um, Dr. Michelle, you mentioned um, fresh food. So my my mom had turkeys she had pigeons rams cows all of that and we had two massive mango trees and one guava tree and I remember seeing like imagery of 
of suicide in movies. And it was like something with like someone knocking over a chair and hanging. And I thought, well, that seems like the fastest way to get this done. Um, I didn't think of the weight of that. It was just, um, I was so focused on just making things easier for everyone that I was like, okay, if I just do it like that, it's not messy. And they, you know, they'll find my body and they'll be like, okay, well, you know, life goes on. Um, so for some reason, I picked the guava tree. Um, if I had picked our bigger mango tree, I mean, that tree was massive. It was established. It, like, it had to be hundreds of years old. It was very sturdy. The guava tree, not as much. Uh, and I remember being alone in our backyard. Um, I had my plan. I had this little plastic chair that I was going to use, all of that. I had the rope, all of it. Um, and, you know, I put it over the, the guava branch. And by the time I, like, put the rope across my neck and released myself or kind of knocked the chair over, the branch broke and I fell. And my first thought was, oh, I can't even do that right. And I was like, okay, but I just got to pack it and went about my day. And went about my day. And forgot about the rest of kind of moved on from that like okay well I can't su successfully delete myself so I might I guess life just goes on um I you know never really talked about it with anyone until um I think it was almost a decade later when I when I was living in the U.S. that memory came back and I was kind of starting to unpack the reality of of my childhood and growing up in the north but also going to boarding school for six years and navigating what all of that um, did to my mental and emotional health um but I, I think I'll, I'll kind of wrap it up there but that that is kind of that that is what led to the attempt but um obviously I'm here <laughs> wow I mean there's so much to really unpack from there thank you for sharing that story and um I also really loved how you um expanding on your mom's, um, your parents' response of where were we? And I feel like sometimes as parents, we're in these few states where we just try our best day to day, but we really don't realize the impact some of our actions. I mean, I mean, I mean, growing up, we were here as kids and um, mm -hmm. kids will have different reactions to that. And, and I imagine you grew up in a very, very loving environment. And saying that, you know, all of that still came from that. So um, you mentioned something earlier as well, as how um, during this time of the year, you know, holidays are quite you know, sensitive, even though the goal is to spend time with your family during Christmas and Thanksgiving, but you see that those rates are, um, the rates of mental health issues and suicide, and especially being with some family members can trigger some thoughts. So um, I know you relocated to the, you moved to the US when you're young, I think you were 17 or so when you moved here, right? Yeah. How did you do that? I, I mean, like being by yourself um, and alone without support. Undoubtedly, that was very challenging. How were you able to safeguard your mental health during this time? And I know there's a spirit of um, a lot of Africans sending their kids you know, over here to get better education. Sometimes the kids are just left with their devices. 17 is awfully young. Um, mm -hmm. Some might you know, care better than others, but it's too young to be in a place. So how were you able to do that? And when you talked about the feelings of suicide coming back again, what were some safeguard measures that you had to protect yourself during those times? Mm. Um. It was quite a few things. So as far as support, I wasn't necessarily completely alone. I had family friends here who were Nigerian, um, Hausa speakers who like, did everything they could to make me feel at home. Um, so during the holidays, so it was Thanksgiving or Christmas, I would just take a, the train to, to go to the south side of Chicago to be with them. So um, their presence was just, it was really a gift. Um, <clears throat> I will say though, there was this, almost a cognitive dissonance that was happening where I wasn't thinking about my mental health. It was just like, you have come this far. You are the first in your family um, as my nuclear family, because both my uncles or two of my uncles um, schooled in Egypt. But I was the first, I guess, the first in my family to come this far for school. So it was like, don't embarrass them. Don't embarrass them. Like Whatever it is that you're dealing with in your mental health, that can wait. We're going to push that to the side because you have a job to do. Your job is to come be a student, represent your family, um, and just deal with whatever whatever uh, the mental health challenge is. Like there will be a time for dealing with that, and that is not the healthiest approach. If I could have done things differently, I would have. If I knew then what I do, what I know now, I would have been a lot more open with my family. But um, back then, it was very much the just grin and bear it because there's work to do.
All right, thank you for that. Um, real quick, as a rounding off your session, would be doing casting your mind back to those times where you had the most difficulty, right? What mm -hmm. words would you have liked to hear um, from your present self to your younger self? Looking back. Um, oh, it's a good question. So, a, f a couple, a few different things. Um, so, a huge part of my story is my faith, right? So, even the way that I ended up in the US involved dreams and visions and it was very there are very specific things that I prayed for that I knew okay Lord I'm your child so you're going to protect me and all of that um <clears throat> however there was a legalistic part to my faith that didn't allow me to be as raw and honest in my faith as I could have been um and so if I could say something to my younger self is it's okay to tell God that you feel confused, that you feel lost and you feel forgotten. Um, and like, because God is not too scared. He's or he's not scared at all. He's not surprised at your questions. He's not confused by your questions. Um, yeah, so I, I would I would push myself to be more honest and to practice some vulnerability um, because that does not come with the culture. I love that. I think compounded with your position as a first daughter and depression and you, you know, just feeling like you have to be that model um, for your parents and even your siblings, I can definitely imagine that complexity. Um, finally, it would be, well, not finally, because I'm sure he will have some questions. Um, yeah. And I hate to ask it this way because the signs are usually often not so subtle. Do you think there were signs that you were giving up but people didn't see? I mean, what are some of the signs, you know, or what are additional things parents or guardians need to know to watch out for? I think it was the kinds of questions I would ask that could that could have been the signs, right? So I was looking for signs of being loved and signs of feeling enough. And so I would ask things like, um, like, uh, do I have to do this? Or um, how do you feel when I do this, right? So I was trying to kind of pull something. Um, and when I was, even younger, uh, I guess younger than college age and as a secondary school, um, it was in the things I would do, right? So I would, it, I didn't have much housing syndrome, but I would want to be sick so I could find, I, I could um, get, sh see some kind of reaction, right? Some kind of um, sympathy, nurture yeah. mm -hmm. reaction, right? Yeah, and, and I realized, <laughs> thankfully, it wasn't much as because I would not make myself sick. But there was that desire to be like, man, it'd be great right now if I had some kind of health issue, you know. Um, and so the signs are very subtle. Um, and I think they show up differently in the, in different children. They're, I don't think there's necessarily a template that fits all. And Dr. Michelle, I'm sure you can speak more to this. Um, but as the elder child, oh, the oldest child who had more of an avoidant um personality because I didn't want want to feel like a burden um I wasn't presenting it in, in signs the way that um a more anxious child would mm -hmm. if that makes yeah. sense wow thank you so much and um we'll be right back with you but let's go on to um Dr. Yamide starting with you what sparked your interest in psychiatry I feel like I already know that answer to that question but for the sake of people who don't really know you yet and why you're answering that could you shed light on the complexities surrounding preteen mental health and suicide pre prevention um thank thanks for the questions um and thank you again jessica for sharing um that story i feel like because i remember hearing the the shorter version of the story and and um yeah thanks for going into the, like a bit more detail on what it felt like and how you got to that point um especially because yeah in, in what sounds like a really difficult time um how, how did i get into psychiatry um it's it's a combination of a bunch of things. One was I've always been interested in, in psychology, in like so one of the one of my so funny stories is I read this book on child jealousy when I was like eight or nine. Um, and it was just because I went to my grandparents. So my grandparents, we used to go to my grandparents every Christmas, and I they had a, they, a pretty extensive library and I would always, every time we went there, I would just go to the library and look for a book I hadn't read yet. And because there were so many books and we used to go so so infrequently, it took a few years before I felt like, I think I was well into my teens before I was like, do you know what? I think I'm, I think I've taken everything I want. 
Yeah, I didn't read every single book they had, but like I read everyone. And the, the interesting thing was, as I got older, I would find books interesting that had been there the whole time, but I hadn't really been interested in. So that was something interesting to sort of observe. Anyway, I picked up this book on child jealousy. I have no idea why. Um, it was a small book, so that probably contributed to it. And it was just very fascinating. I was just about like children being jealous and how that could lead to the regression and how that could lead to like bedwetting. Um, you know, and, and I was already familiar then with the, you know, issue of like kids bedwetting a bit older than you'd ex expect. You know, I sort of started thinking, hmm, maybe jealous of a sibling. <laughs> You know, and I know that sort of thing. Um, I, I probably understand a lot of what was in it, but it was enough that I think I was just really curious. Like, wow, people are very complex, and there's so much going on under the surface. And I, I was just very curious about that. Um, and then I sort of put it aside because, although I knew that psychology was a job, I did not know until well into my adulthood a single actual human psychologist that was not like on TV. So it never really crossed my mind to study psychology. It was just, in, you know, also in Nigeria, I was not one of the four sort of, you know, you know, the four career options. Um, and I've heard lots of people in African countries and, you know, some of my Indian and other friends, Asian friends as well, talk about, you know, doctor, lawyer, engineer, failure. Those are your options, right? <laughs> so, so psychologist was not, was unfortunately not in that list. Um, and yeah. I think I ended up going to medical school, but I realized very quickly that I was more interested. I, I remember telling my mom at one point that I realized I'm way more interested in the mind than in the body. But then I didn't know then that I wanted to do psychiatry yet because I remember feeling like, okay, I am interested in psychology, but psychiatry is like mental illness, right? And I'm more interested in like, why do people do things? <laughs> and, 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 and this just feels like, yeah, I forget why they do things. We're just going to get to them when they break down. Um, so for a while, as much as I did actually enjoy my psychology, psychiatry posting, which is criminally small in medical school, it's like a week, no, sorry, it's like a month in most medical schools, six weeks in some places. Um, it's in the current, um, the, the hospital where I currently work, we get medical students and they, they still do four weeks. They do six weeks, but they do two weeks of teaching. So it doesn't really count. So they only spend four weeks in the, um, in the hospital. Um, and yeah, I went into medical school, uh, did the four week psychiatry posting. It was very short, just for context, other medical postings are like three months. So just give you an, you know, and which is wild when you think about the fact that psychiatry is something everybody ends up interacting with, no matter the specialty you go to. So you, you would, you would think you should have a little bit more of an idea of what's going on here. Um, but no. Um. Anyway, so I ended up doing it, and then I didn't get to unfortunately do it in my my house job year, my um foundation internship year, um, which I think was how some people ended up deciding. Oh, do you know? I think I want to do this. Um, but at some point in the year after that, so in Nigeria, you have to do your community service for after you finish any. Um, and some point during that year, it just sort of fell in place for me. Um. And it fell in place for me in such a very weird way because it was like, the minute it fell in place, it was like, duh. Like, why was I even considering anything else? And like, this is so obvious. I can't even believe I didn't see it before now. Um, obvious, uh, I mean, from a Christian point of view, I, I, that's one of those things where I would feel like it was God. I just sort of like opened my eyes to see it, you know. But from a psychological point of view, it was just like a sort of like instant moment of clarity, right? So depending on how you want to describe it. Um, and 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 that was it really. Um, I think I did. I practiced medicine for. I did my internship year. I did community service year. I did another year in private practice. Um, after that, and and I did psychiatry, and I never looked back. So, oh dear. So uh, <laughs> thanks for that. Um, so, so what do you think are some of the complexities surrounding you know preteen mental health and suicide prevention? Um, the main complexities are they are preteen, <laughs> and you you work with them a lot, you know, and um... yeah. Well, so I've worked to, in the other weird thing is I don't know if it's not weird. The same year I graduated from medical school and started like internship, that exact same year I started volunteering with young people, which is a sort of a whole other story why it happened that year. It wasn't connected to graduating medical school, 
um but it kind of was at the same time but anyway i started pretty much so in i i often like to joke that i've always worked two jobs and one of them wasn't paid <laughs> because uh but yeah i've done i've done like youth volunteering for as long as i've practiced and yeah and i also like to say to my friends who are parents because i haven't got kids but i like to like what they lack in what what i lack in depth you know i make up for in breath because <laughs> Because unless you're a teacher, you're probably not interacting with as many kids as I have. <laughs> if you're a teacher, you have, and I, I, you know, I, I'm not even going to compete. <laughs> so, um, um, <laughs> sorry. Finish it. Finish it. I was going to wrap up. Um, but yeah, so I, yeah, I have, I haven't worked a lot with teenagers as part of my job. So I don't work in in the UK. It's called CAMS. Um, but it's basically like child and adolescent mental health. So it's CAMS because child and adolescent mental health service is oh. why it's called CAMS in the UK. Um, and I haven't done a lot of it. Um, I have occasionally interacted with a few young people, but not as like, it's not like the area of specialty I've gone into. Um, but I, you know, you you see some of it and then you also have to think about what happened to people in their teenagers, even though you meet them as adults. Oh. Um, but then of course, like I said, because of my volunteering, I've seen the sort of low level bits, right? So not not like to the level where they need to be in psychiatric um, care or um, secondary mental health care, but like, you know, just like, you know, feeling low, feeling bad, feeling shame, feeling guilt, all of this, that stuff. Okay. Um, but when I said jokingly, and I, I was ha only half joking that it's because they're preteens, um, because I think it's mainly just, and this happens with kids as well, um, like children, children, like people have this idea that, you know, and they used to say it in Nigeria. I don't know if they said it in into um, people from other parts of Africa on here, um, but you can let us know if, if you heard it. But like they often say, what are you worrying about? You're a child, you know, <laughs> like, I'm sorry. If I'm worrying that my friend is not talking to me as a kid, yes, I know from an adult point of view, it's probably not the biggest thing in the world. But you know what I'm not? I'm not an adult. I'm a child. And this is the biggest thing in my world right now. Oh, no. <laughs> it's, it's a kind of story, right? And I think it's this thing where, again, I think working with young people has helped me sort of see this more. It's people forget all the time that they used to be kids. So a lot of what I do in interacting with parents is sort of reminding them but you know this is you right like this is it's not like this child just did this thing that no child ever has ever done it's literally what all of us did and what they're doing like this is entirely you know like i, I have two definitions of normal there's the normal of what you would like it, things to be but there's the normal of what normally happens whether you like it or not right and for instance, it is normal that a child will lie at some point. <laughs> and actually, it's part of that cognitive development. Like, if you if a child doesn't lie, you should be worried that they're not actually becoming more intelligent. Because lying is basically the moment when they understand that, oh, you mean I can hold back some of the truth and I can change how you think about reality? <laughs> That's an important developmental like, area, right? But obviously, you don't want them to lie. I'm just saying, like, but the instinct to lie will come. You know, it's that sort of thing. So that's normal. Not normal in the sense of that's something you want, but normal in the sense of that's something that will happen. Um, and so all of this stuff is normal. And I think adults forget all the time that that they were formerly kids and that kids feel things and that those feelings are no less strong because they're children, right? Like the anger is real. The shame is real. The guilt is real. The, the grief is real when a child loses, you know, something or someone. Um, and all of these things are real. And so um, a lot of a lot of what um, we can help kids with is just, you know, helping them to name their emotions, helping them to... Um, there's a really good book that um, the consultant I work with always recommends, which is very... You, you'll see why this is funny. Uh, to everybody that comes into the, the, into the team, um, well, to every doctor... Um, and it's called How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk. You may or may not know the book. Um, this book appeared in Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, by the way, which was very exciting for me. It was, it was a moment. Anyway, um, but yeah, the, the, the point of the book is, even though we work with adults, it turns out that the things that work for kids work for adults. Because 
kids and adults are both human at the end of the day. Adults are just better hiding some of those things. Like adults throw tantrums, but we don't call them tantrums, right? We just say, oh, um, he's shouting at everybody or whatever. Like, like at the end of the day, it's a tantrum. Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, adults talk, adults do all the things kids do. We just do it in sort of socially acceptable ways. Um, and so it turns out that all of this stuff for kids, and one of the big things in the book is about like, helping kids name their feelings, helping kids. And one of the challenges I think is that a lot of people become adults and they still don't know how to discuss how they feel um, because they didn't learn the language for that, right? Um, and I feel like listening to um, what you were saying, Jessica, I feel like that was part of what you were struggling with was you were feeling things and you couldn't, you couldn't talk about them because you didn't have the language to talk about them. And the language that you had wasn't helping you talk about them. And so you couldn't talk about them. And so even if someone had asked you about them, you probably couldn't have said anything, right? Because you didn't have the language. It's, it's, like, it's like, like, if you don't have the language, you don't have the language. Like, there's nothing you can do. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I think, I think, but, and, and then the only other thing I would say, which um, Jessica also um, uh, mentioned, is that with kids, you see slightly different expressions of, of these things. So you don't see the adults necessarily adult expressions and and so it's especially for younger kids um preteens and children you know it it can be things as like kids will sometimes say things like like what you were saying about the sort of munchausen's thing that's actually very common it's not munchausen's though by the way um in that at that level anyway for a child um but yeah kids will sometimes say well i feel a tummy pain or something but actually what they Again, it's just because they don't have the language for... I'm not saying that every time a kid feels a tummy pain, they're depressed, obviously. Um, sometimes a tummy pain is just a tummy pain. Most times, actually. But but if, if you know, if you... if Sometimes, if you've tried everything and nothing else is working, it's probably worth thinking about helping them with language for how they feel. And a good way to do that, actually, even before they start to feel those ways, is to say, you know, when you see a child demonstrating something that looks like an emotional reaction, like anger, for instance... Um, a good step is simply to say you're angry, right? Or or just like literally say what it is and then say, you know, do you want to tell me why you're angry or whatever? Like just, you're not, and, and I think parents and adults in general often fear that they will be telling the kid that's okay. And it's like, no, it's like if someone is bleeding and you're asking them how they started bleeding, you're not saying it's okay that they are bleeding. You're just, you're just trying to understand how the bleeding happened. Right. And so it's it's the same. It's 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 just giving them that space to say, okay, why are you feeling this way? What happened? You know, and and unfortunately, the first thing we normally do, um, and sometimes even adults do this, is well, you shouldn't be angry. It's like, I don't know, maybe it's a little late for that because you know what? I already am angry. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, like you know how it is when someone tells you to calm down and they're like, I'm not I'm calm. Which is, which is always hilarious, <laughs> right? It's, it's, yeah. So it's like, well, they're already angry. So maybe it's worth thinking about. How, it's, it's like again, this, this, this may have happened to you as kids. It happened to me. Um, you break a plate and somebody be like, "Why are you so clumsy?" And it's like, e, I don't know, but like the plate's already broken. <laughs> so, also, it wasn't like it was intentional. So, <laughs> you know, but yeah, it's, it's that sort of thing of like the thing has happened and it's probably not the best time to talk about maybe don't do the thing that has already happened. It's probably a more useful time to think about what happened and how did it happen and what are you thinking right now? And and then you can get to, well, what do we do next time you're feeling this way? Okay. Well, thank you for that reminder, especially um, always remembering that this is their first time like, and that thing you said about People forget that it used to be once kids. I think that's very, very apt. And then um, labeling the emotions. So your child is angry or sad, just label, oh, I can see you're sad. Can we talk about it? And then exploring that. I think that's a very, very good strategy. Now, before I move on to Dr. Michelle, I had this question of you. Um, I mean, social media is huge, especially among teens. And um, you have a lot of kids who were basically maybe sad through social media and phones and all that. And definitely it can also lead to some behavioral issue behavioral issues considering this digital aspect of lives that have you know really changed if it contrasts that to how we grew up 
how do you recommend parents navigating these situations um, without straining the relationship they have with their kids? And then you also have issues with bullying and you know social media peer pressure, and even the peer pressure they already face in the classroom. What are some strategies to help parents navigate these um, complex issues? Just, is that for me? It's for you, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, all right. I know you said before you go to Dr. Michelle, but then yeah, I yeah, thought, for, oh, you, for you, yeah. for you, for yeah. you, okay. Um. So can you can you just run that back again? Like sure, there were like sure. two questions in there. I know, I know, and I tested Sorry. it. <laughs> nice calling me out on that. So first to be um there's issues with bullying and then also um this pervasive use of social media, especially among um teenagers and preteens. How do parents um begin to reel those um their kids back into that safety without causing that alienation? Because um it's for example, I see a lot of you know teams now who are so dependent on their phones and even on social media platforms where they expose to so many issues with peer pressure and there's also bullying going on. What are some strategies to help parents you know become better custodians of these kids who are maybe often too spending too much time on social media platforms where they might be prone to more um, um, bullying? And I think Jessica would also like to pitch on this when you don't happen. So that would be nice to see. Um. Well, I think I think it, the big the big sort of principle I think is thinking less in. I think with technology, there's a thing where it's easy to focus on the dangers and the risks, and and historically, you you and I have talked about this a lot. Historically, that's human nature, right? Like, you know, Plato was worried that books would make young men forget how to remember things. Books. And there was a bicycle too. The bicycle, right? Would... There was concerns yeah. about bicycles and women and and all sorts of things that it could do to damage people. Um, there were concerns about cars when cars came. There were concerns about trains. There were concerns about television, personal computers, and smartphones and social media and the internet and whatever else is coming. Oh, of course, and there's AI now, isn't there? That's that's the new thing everyone's freaking out about. Um. I don't think that's a helpful way to think about things. Um, I think it's more helpful to think about how can how can I help this person or these people um, live well, given all of these realities, because these things are reality, um, and and that's it. That allows us to sort of create space for meaningful use, and as against um sort of harmful use um and i think the problem is sometimes when people come at it from the sort of restrictive mindset then it's just about how do i limit it um and then that in itself can backfire as you know again i'm sure we all know people growing up who were restricted from something or the other and then the first chance they got they went hard the other way i never looked back right um and 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 of course that again there's all those stories that are human and go back as far as forever it's just the specific technology or thing is what is different um and yeah in terms of that there's there's a lot of ways to think about it there are um every main every, i know ios android and well those are the two main ones aren't they um uh, windows and mac os as well have major sort of screen time things that you can use which I always say, like, if you're a parent, you have to familiarize yourself with um, ways of sort of keeping an eye on frequency of use of devices, right? But also, like, what times they're using devices. Especially, I think, as people get into teenage, um, there's this tendency to use them late into the night, and then that affects their sleep and stuff like that. Now, something I just wanted to highlight is people always talk like, oh, young people are on their phones all the time. I'm sorry, people are on their phones all the time of all ages, like this is not a young people problem, right? This is this is a, this is an all people problem. You know, again, it, everything people look at young people for is really something that we're all doing. Like adults are on their phones all the time. Adults are on their phones late into the night and not sleeping. Adults, like, do you know what I mean? Now, of course, it's easier to overdo these things a bit because they're younger and they have less sense of risk and all of that. But like, let's not act like they're the only ones who are having these problems. Adults are consuming all sorts of craziness from this internet and social media and spewing it back to people on the internet and social media and in real life all the time. Um, 
so yeah but i think it's really about just thinking about using these things wisely using them well being aware of the risks um and and talking to them about what the risks are i think sometimes people don't want to talk about the risks, but it's like well you have to talk about the risks because if not then it's not real um and and just letting them be aware of that but also being aware of little sort of basic guidelines like don't add people you don't know um talk to people you know that sort of thing um i mean just use as an example of like how social media can be good. I know, I know, I know some kids who it's their main way of, you know, they play Roblox or Minecraft with their friends and family members across the world. And they're keeping in touch almost every other day through Minecraft and Roblox. Now, they could also be talking to some random people, but I think these particular kids, they've they've been taught enough and understand enough that that's not a wise thing to do. So it's mostly, as far as I know, it's just with their friends. Um, the other thing is accept the reality that whatever safeguards you put, kids will try and break them at some point because that's what that's what kids do. Um, and some of that is intelligence, and you should probably be like secretly happy about it, but never let them know. Um, and some of it is also just like, okay, yeah, you flex your muscles now, but let like let's be serious. This there's actual dangers and risks here. But again, it's sort of like picking your battles, and then also the other thing about thinking about it in terms of helping them live with it is as you get as they get older you want to be reducing the restrictions don't you so you know and then thinking about when that is and something funny i always find with most parents is the ages for when they will introduce or, re, or remove certain restrictions it goes down as you know it, with the more children they have the ages go down um, but i think that's also a reflection of realizing you know maybe i was freaking out a little bit too much to begin yeah. with yeah Thank you. Thank you so much. Jessica, you wanted to chime in on this one before we go to yeah. Dr. Michelle. Yeah. Uh, Mo, could you please repeat the question? I want to be sure I don't It's miss... about um, social media use, bullying, and you know, parents becoming more um, proactive in that regard. Yeah. Yes. So uh, one of the things I see a lot is parents, and I will post a disclaimer, I'm not a parent. Um, so there, I'm sure there are things that parents can speak to that, that I cannot yet. Uh, but I will say I see several parents falling into this um, not my kid syndrome or like N NMK syndrome. I, it was not an original. I heard it somewhere. The disbelief that your child could be the bully or your child could be receiving, you know, could be on the receiving end of bullying. Um, and so out of that mindset, they don't take as much time to learn what their children are learning um, because they, they're they adults. They have other things to, to deal with. So you really can never learn too much of what's normal for your child now and drop those expectations of what your child could be doing. There are people, like, like I, I mean, was, uh, was was saying, there are people. <laughs> they're, they're going to do what you probably would have done at their age if you had the same access to social media. Um, but absolutely, the, the not my kid syndrome needs to go. <laughs> That's a good point. Thank you so much. Um, I think there's this meme that you say, oh, my child will never, and then your child would do that same thing, like, watch them never do, never, what you say, they can never do, or something like that, and that cracked me up. And, but thanks for that reminder. It's a sober reminder that, you know, um, we need to be vigilant, you know, because if we're talking about bullying really high, who are those bullying the kids, you know? It has to be, you know, kids doing the bullying, you know? So um, what that was the odds that that sample size would be quite as high as um, the victims as well. Um, last but not least, this is um, Dr. Michelle and you have a lot to unpack. So maybe just share a little bit about your practice and the unique um, approaches you implement, considering that you're set in the very heart of Africa in your lovely homeland of um, Longwe, uh, Malawi. Thank you. Um, all right. so. I think just like any African country, mental health uh, in Malawi is in the pits. Um, so the priority here is physical health. I mean, if you have a broken bone, if you're shrieking in physical pain, uh, that's what you know the government prioritizes. So mental health doesn't get much funding as such. Um, we have I we have the psychiatric hospitals <clears throat> and the academia, nothing else in between. So I am mainly in the academia and my psychosocial support work really involves um, psychoeducation and mental literacy. And just listening to Jessica and Ayamide talk about um, emotions, just asking basic questions such as, um, are you angry? 
I think that's the big of what I do, that can we just talk about emotions? Can we just acknowledge that we feel angry, uh, that we feel anxious? And just coming back, I don't know what comes first. Uh, you know, it's the chicken and egg question. We've been talking about children, but when, as I was listening, I was like, let's talk about parents because everything that we're talking about comes down to the parents their own unresolved traumas, their own fears, their own understanding. For example, um, the fear of one's in Africa is real. Uh, experience poverty, you don't want your children to experience that. So that's where the pressure comes in, you know, get everything right, get a such you you push your children. I've got a seven year and um I was young teaching him ABCs homeschooling and the like. And as with every boy, don't really like to read when you force them. All right. So and then he reached six, seven in interest, but he does love listening to me read. So and then I go to school, I feel the pressure. And as is typical of teachers in Africa, oh, you know what? That kid is doing that. Sorry, is it me or I'm missing every other word? With my chat, he started Is the mic moving in and out? Is it just me? It's Can me. you hear me? Oh, okay. Maybe it's just me then. I thought I was missing every, like, you, you just go off and on. Maybe it's just me. Sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt okay. you. I just wanted to be sure that the audio was not just um, on my end. Yeah, all right. So I started him and he started losing interest in reading. And then I said, wait a minute. And I took a step back. I had to work on my fears about what success is. Uh, and, you know, speaking of social media, everyone's putting on their WhatsApp status if their child draws a pig, even if it looks like a cow. Oh, my God, he's such an artist or stuff like that. And you get pressured. Is my child lagging behind? So I had to sit myself down and say, OK, what are these fears doing to your to your to your son? You're lowering his confidence. You're putting pressure on him. He's now disliking what he needs to do. So just to mention that, that in whatever you were talking about, it's also sort of like digging the root of the problem that kids, um, it's the parents' anxieties and fears on their kids. So it's not only our uh, psychological makeup or unresolved traumas, it's the cultural messages we carry that are invalid, all right? So for example, if your kid wants to be an artist, uh, if in your society that if that's not success you, you, we know we have to get over that all right not interested in science that's okay if he wants to to, to you know do something else to music we're just discussing with my brother the other day um he, he said to me you know we send our kids to good schools whether they're posh private schools but if your child decides to open a bar beside a lake and sell, I don't know, beers. That's the that's the thing. So I just wanted to mention that that with emotions, it starts starts with the parents. And um, with African communities, having children is like a successful thing. It's like now you're holy. It's like I can say this as a psychologist that other people are not equipped to be parents themselves because they're still carrying the trauma, and other people especially those who have got unresolved issues are the ones that contribute to the, you know, poor mental. So I just wanted to get out of the way. So my approach is really in that sense that can we talk about mental health? Can we acknowledge um, that there are these emotions that need to be addressed? Can we acknowledge that what we do to each other has an impact? Can we acknowledge, can we, can we look at someone and wonder what, how they're doing? Can we look at our kids and ask them, how are you feeling today? So even just explaining concepts like what mental health is, what does it mean when someone says I'm depressed? What does it mean when someone says I'm anxious? What is making them anxious? What is What are their fears? And uh, really, you see, I see a big difference 
when people say, oh, all right, I remember this other day or this other time when I lost my, you know, grandmother, I was just feeling this way. So I was actually, you know, grieving. So if you put a name, like Ayumida said, if you put a name to what you're experiencing, it's like you've named the monster and you can, you know, uh, better able, you know, to, to deal with that. So I also tap on the resources that we have, as I mentioned, I'm not going to go into a counseling room or you're not going to, to talk to a therapist. So we are in a society where there's a lot of structures for social support. Um, we, we're actually a very communal society. So if there's a wedding, if uh, there's a funeral or just gathering. So I also utilize that because to me, social connection is important, feeling that you belong, interacting with people. And in Malawi, it's that sort of country where you'd go into a mini bus or a mini van and strike a conversation with a stranger all the way for two hours. You talk like you've known each other for years. And that, you know, understanding each other, just, you know, getting each other, sharing jokes. And at some points, you know, you'd sit in a mini bus and just listen to two people converse and, the, you know, people would just join in. So for me, that um, instinctive social connection, feeling that we're one. Um, I studied in Bangor um, in the in the UK, miserable place. On top of that, it, I, I mean, I remember days when I would not talk to anyone, right? I would, go, and you know, after the end of the day, I, I would think I haven't even talked to anyone. I went to Morrison's to get my bread. I went, but I didn't really talk to anyone. I didn't have eye contact with anyone. I mean, how would that, you know, make you feel. So I encourage that. And um, so you might not actually be talking about what's bothering you, but I think that that, that connection with other human beings. So I, I really like tapping into that. And I also believe that because Malawi is very raw, very natural, that works on our mental health because it's, it's just really a beautiful country, beautiful weather and, and beautiful people. So despite the adversity, I think it's that sort of country where you can't help but smile, whether it's the people or, you know, what you've, what you've experienced. You know, oh, I think she's frozen. Is she frozen, just me? She's frozen, no, not just you, she's frozen. Yeah, and while she's she back, Oh, while she tries to go back, and I think what she said was oh. just so spot on. Are you there, Michelle? Doctor Michelle, are you still there? All right. Um, and I think Ayamide has mentioned the same Hello? thing. Okay. I was okay. frozen for a bit, right? Okay. Sorry. You're back. You're back. Yeah. Please go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Where did I stop? <laughs> um, just about the um, you about the natural nature of um, um, Malawi. You believe yeah. you're about saying something about you believe something about the nature and all that. Nature. Okay. Yeah. That that our natural environment. And, uh, and in fact, the way we do things, because it's not a very advanced country, so everything is pretty, you know, manual. You carry stuff. You have to ha ask someone to help you. So there are lots of opportunities to interact. Our banks, I don't know if I should call them, no, I don't want to use the word incompetent, but they're quite slow. So you tend to stand very long times in the line in the bank and just not to get bored, you're chatting up with someone. So it's that sort of environment. The road traffic, it's the same. You want to renew your license, you know, you just take your snacks and water and stand and just chat with people because yeah, that, that, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. So yeah, something um, Michelle said, I think I mean I mean also said so around parenting and I mean you kind of mentioned overcorrecting. I remember a conversation I was having with my therapist shout out to therapists, um, a few years ago about the uh, fear of parenting that came from that attempt, right? Like being so scared of repeating um, uh, the environment that led to the attempt, like so scared of repeating it in my children. Um, and so the overcorrection there was, I'm never having children. And with other people, the overcorrection is I'm going to have children so I can do everything my parents didn't do. And then because of that, you know, that locked in mindset you end up inadvertently repeating it because you haven't dealt with the with the trauma and I, I've seen I've kind of walked through um to what you're saying Michelle 
um, walking through my own traumas when I think about reproducing and it no longer gives me, I don't break into a sweat anymore when I think about reproducing. And there was a time that it would, I would have a very visceral reaction to the thought um, of, of having children, but there's been so much power in addressing my why with professional help um, and marrying a person who has who is very familiar with therapy and who is healthy in himself and has worked through a lot of his own traumas um, that um, is also very aware of mine and continues to create a space for me to, you know, um, to share how I'm feeling in any moment about, uh, about reproducing. Um, I'm very, very thankful for that, but I'm also so glad you mentioned that, Michelle. Yeah, and I think it's just admitting as well that parents are also human beings, all right? I know I don't remember my parents saying sorry to me, <laughs> you know, but I make You're it African, I'm sorry. It's not in our vocabulary. <laughs> sorry, and I, I love try. you. <laughs> I try. Well, I, I mean, I tell him that, you know, I'm sorry I was impatient with you because I, he looks surprised, but I'm, I, I just hope he remembers in, in the future that, okay, at least my mom tried oh, to no. say sorry when he was impatient <laughs> because we, we're also not perfect. And, um, um, I mean, we are our authentic selves. When you are tired, you are tired and you're, you're impatient. But I, I do try to be human, to say I'm not perfect, um, to say parents are not wrong, you know, because the, the, the flip side of that is that they even take those low moments that you have when you make them feel in a certain way. They, they, they believe that. But when you show them that I'm sorry, they know that you can make a mistake. And when they grow up, they can, They should comfortably say, my, my mom was wrong when she made me feel this way or when she said this. Oh, thank you to all of you um, panelists. And I um, also love the, uh, I mean, so profound um, messages you guys have thrown here. And even happening on what you just said last about the social cohesiveness of our cultures as Africans. And I think that a lot of us, um, until we move to this side of the world, begin to appreciate just the kind of societies we are brought in. Don't get me wrong, I mean, a lot of our countries have some issues with infrastructure and all that. But the way this, I think there's, there's just that beauty of human connection. And I think I already mm -hmm. said this a lot on several of our episodes about those micro conversations you have, maybe from your neighbor just saying, ah, fine girl, or you get to the bus stop, somebody just having conversations with you that even if you're not welcome in it, you don't know how the impact on your mental health until you move to a country like here where I might not see my neighbors for like a whole year, you know, cause I'm driving in and out of my garage and, you know, we don't talk. You know, and if you if you move here in your twenties and you're like, why am I depressed all of a sudden? No one talking, no one checking in on you, and that really impacts your mental health. And I know we've talked about traumas and all that, and physical abuse. I should also stress the importance of verbal abuse. Um, those mm -hmm. can also play a lot of role, especially when you're older and you. Those are the things you keep playing over and over again in your head. And I think this is the space to acknowledge that, you know, as parents, we 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 have a lot of work to do, but there's also grace. And I think having those conversations, for me, becoming a parent, I've had to really undergo therapy because I'll just find myself doing things that I know was very against my own very nature. And there were things I learned as a ch child growing up, you know, just the instant reaction and just, you know, losing control and um, giving myself grace and um, redeeming the situation. My daughter is four and I, I tell her I'm sorry so many times. And she knows that word so much. She's saying it back to me quickly when I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, and I forgive you. I love you. I still love you. So these are some of the things I've had to learn. Um, and our parents, they did their best. But again, the importance of that trauma that you talked about and finding out what makes you tick. I think um, those are the um, um, supporting words that I'll, I'll leave today. Now moving on to our Q&A. And the first question I would like to ask um, all of you would, would be this. I mean, for, first of all, let me ask, uh, ask the question that was posed by one of our, um, our listeners, Nelly Pulsa from Zimbabwe, thank you. She was like, what can you give parents? What advice can you give parents when building their mm -hmm. relationships with their children? to avoid suicide. So let's start with that. Um, can I start? Sure. Um, I think for me, um, it's what I said earlier on, talk about emotions, normalize emotions. Don't demonize anger. Don't demonize well, uh, when, it, when a child is crying and create uh, a psychologically safe environment. By this, I mean an environment where the child is able to express their emotions without feeling that they'll be uh, penalized or without feeling that they'll be told off. 
our reaction to a happy child should be the same reaction um, to a sad child. Easier said than done, because what usually happens when a child exhibits negative emotions, it triggers us, especially if we have what I already mentioned, some trauma in our background. So if you see a child distressed, and if as a child, when you were distressed, you were shouted at, it triggers that, and your reaction also becomes um, a, a trauma reaction. So it's important to learn to respond to any negative emotion as kindly as you would um, any you know positive emotion so that the child should feel okay expressing uh, both emotions. So like I mentioned, I think it starts with the parents. You know, these conversations never take place. Uh, when they, they teach you about breastfeeding, they teach you about changing diapers, they teach you about everything physical and practical, but this just never takes place to sit down with yourself and say, what are my issues? Even more so when you're coming from two different backgrounds. I'm a single parent, so I don't know, I should say luckily, but there's no uh, parenting style, different parenting style. So you can imagine if your par parents from different backgrounds and you're all, you're reacting differently to these emotions, all right? So for, for some, you may react. Uh, for others, they shut down. I know parents who just like emotionally block you know, the, their children to say, okay, they're like not even responding when the child is crying, they're looking at them like, you know, a blank face and the child is confused. So start with your own emotional literacy. What are your triggers? How do you react emotionally? And coming down to actually understanding the emotional issues that children have, Ayumide uh, alluded a lot to those but just understanding that uh, uh, self-harm or suicide attempts don't just occur, they're usually prolonged mental health issues that haven't been attended to. Depression, anxiety, and as Jessica was explaining, I think her home environment was very highly anxious where you would be walking on eggshells, second guessing, what should I say, how should I be? So issues like depression, anxiety, uh, when they are prolonged, they build up to that moment. And this is because as human beings, we're not born to tolerate a lot of emotional distress. So as we grow older, we develop that tolerance, what we call this distress tolerance, where you're able to sit with negative, negative emotions for some time. For children, that is very low. They can't just contain negative emotions for a long time. They can't be anxious or sad or depressed for a long time. So because they don't have the skills to manage this tolerance, uh, that's when these ideas, the suicidal ideation comes in, the self-harm comes in, the I should just disappear comes in. So that's why it's important to, like I mentioned, just normalize negative emotions. It's okay to be angry, you know, cry, you, you and to teach them how to emotionally regulate. You know, you can cry, and then they learn how to, to, to regulate. So it, it should be normal, even as an adult, when you're angry to cry. And once you know that you're going to, to keep, to be, to, you know, to, to stabilize. But for some, it's like, oh, I can't feel bad. I can't, I can't feel like this. Therefore, I should end this pain. And um, yeah, the other thing is um, just making sure that there are protective mechanisms because I am more of the preventive, you know, mental side of things. What environment are they, are they growing in? Are there other people around apart from the parents that the child can talk to? You know what? Sometimes when I'm angry or when I know that I'm gonna lose patience, I tell my help, there's a nice lady, uh, my son's nanny, you know, can you talk to him if maybe he did something at school so that he has different support um, systems, or if they're close to an auntie or an uncle, I'm very close to my, my niece. My sister at certain points cannot talk to, to her daughter, but I'm very close to her. So allow that because I know African parents were like, you know what, I educated this child and I'm gonna make sure that <laughs> it's about finances, right? I want, I want this child to take care of me. So we, we're also very possessive of our children, you know? We want them to bond so much with us, but we have to let the child have other sources of emotional support. Even a best friend, it's okay. Don't go like, oh, why are you talking to your best friend, not me? Just allow them to 
to, to create other sources where they can, you know, find the support. Wow. Thank you so much for that. Um, especially with the taking stock of our own emotional literacy. And so I would just share something a bit vulnerable. Um, becoming a parent, I've been able to almost like see myself in a different light because nothing really shows you how much grace you need as a human being than being a parent. And one thing that really got me, so whenever my daughter would make a mess, there was a trigger that just came out for me because apparently, I mean, I don't like messy areas, but from a child, it was a different kind of trigger. And my reaction was just like, what, what in the world is wrong with you? Children are like, they're supposed to be messy. It's part of their creative process. But my reaction was always so, and it became so, even as I want to start knowing how to wipe. And so I had to start working on that and just maybe looking the other way and having somebody else step in, usually my husband to, to really help out. But I found out that it was because growing up, you know, I grew up in a place with housing issues and there was a lot of mess everywhere. And cleaning was my response trauma, to my, like my trauma response to that. And then bringing that to my parents in. So again, it was true parents that I realized that the way I was reacting to my daughter making messes wasn't really normal, but it was what I'd known. And I didn't know that was a part of me until I started parenting. I just wanted to say that to um, really tag on what you talked about. Like it starts with the parents and we should also understand what our trigger is. So that way we can be effective, not just as parents, but as people, um, period. And I think Ayamide wanted to also um, um, put a little bit on this. So Ayamide, you can go for it. Thanks, Jessica, for that, for that comment, by the way. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm laughing because um, obviously, like I kind of I I know you enough to know how that would have happened. Um, but it's also it's also a great picture, I think, of the reality of parenting. Um, which is, um, and I think this is the case of relationship. One of my favorite things to say, you've probably heard me say this many times, is we need other people to know ourselves, right? We can only know ourselves in relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, this idea of sort of going off into some distance. You know, like I always imagine like if you were to go off into like the desert and like, you know, have this like five year retreat to know who you are, you'd come back the first day from that retreat and somebody would do something and you realize like, OK, I didn't know Jack because I wasn't ready for this. Um, And I think and I think the reason why I say that is because I think that. um, I think that it's important to remember that there are some things we will not know about ourselves until we get into some relationships whether it's so there are some things you don't know and for you know for uh, for you know for people who are you know who have a spouse or partnered you know that there are some things you didn't know about yourself until you became you know sort of together joined with that person um and there are some things you don't know until you have kids and if you have more than one kid you also realize that there are some things you don't know until you have each kid separately because actually, each kid brings out some things that you were not ready for. Um, and the reason why that's important is because in as much as it's useful, I think, to, and so partly to your point, Jessica, um, about it's useful to sort of think about the things that we're carrying. I think there's a level to which you can't know all of those things. And actually, there are some of those things that you cannot know until you sort of, you know, hit the road. And like, you know, you just sort of figure it out. Oh, dang, I have this issue. And you can't, you simply can't know. And, and that's okay. Like that doesn't mean you're, and that's the sense in which people will tell you that you can never be ready for this thing, right? Because, because actually you can only prepare for the things you are thinking about. There are some things you simply would not be thinking about. And so, yes, definitely we, we should all do everything we can based on what we know, but then also be accepting of the fact and of, of the fact that there are some things you simply will not know. Um, And that for me also connects to the other thing about parenting, which is, Parenting is not meant to be a two-parent job, right? Mm -hmm. It's not meant to be like me and my little family, you know. And 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 for me, that's also freeing for even if you're a single parent. Like, look, even if you are one, even if you are two, it still would not be enough people to do this job, because actually, you need a community, right? You need a community to raise any child. You know, it's like that whole. We it takes a village exactly. Well, I was gonna, actually going to share because I have a. a, a at least I wrote on this, which I'll share at some point. Um, but it takes a village, right? You, we can't, and I think one of the big challenges is we live in a time when parents have all of this pressure to be perfect mm -hmm. and to have perfect children. And but at the same time, when there's no support for the parents, right? So it's 
And is this and one of the ways I, I I've seen that is like sometimes when you see parents, a, a parent with a child in public, and the way people are looking at the parent, like you know, and maybe they are struggling a bit, and like people are looking at judging. And I think about like, but in a different context, at least when I grew up, when that kind of thing was happening, it would be people coming around the parent to say, okay, what do you need? How can we help you? Do you want to take a step away and let us help you care for this child? Right? You know, it was like, no, it's our job. It's not your job. And like, deal with your kid. What is your problem? <laughs> right? Um, and I think the, the, the problem, with, so for me, and the reason why I say that is because I think when parents struggle with kids, it's easy to start feeling like, maybe I'm not good enough. And like, no, because you are never meant to do this by yourself. So yeah, you are never going to be good enough if that's your definition of good enough to do this by yourself. And like needing people is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of you recognizing how this is actually meant to work, which is actually, you know, so like what you said, um, Dr. Michelle, like, you know, sometimes you bring your sister in, sometimes you bring the help in, like you're, you're pulling around you for support for this thing because and like like you should not feel guilty about that that's exactly how you should be doing it right and 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 um and and the third thing i just wanted to add is you know one of my favorite concepts in psychology which is the good enough mother um by donald winnicott and it's sort of this idea um that actually it turns out that the parents who were doing the best job were the ones who just tried to be good enough mm -hmm. um and so one of my favorite things from that is good enough is good enough right we sometimes think of good enough as like it's bad mm. it's like no it's literally good enough it's like like just we i think it, and the funny thing about the research was that actually people who tried to be better than good enough ended up making their kids more anxious and so there's something interesting about aiming for perfection that just actually creates more problems whereas aiming for simply like do you know what like i feel like for any parent at the end of the day if you like do you know what some like I, I like to joke with my friends. I'm like, your child didn't die today. You're winning. <laughs> like there's some days when that's all you need, right? And obviously that's not every day. That's every day. Maybe you need some some extra help. But there there are some days. And I think every parent will recognize this. There are some days when it's like, do you know what? This child is still alive, winning. <laughs> it's like you know. And there are days when it's like, look. Like there are some days when you have a great moment with a child, and then there are days when it's like, do you know what? I didn't scream. <laughs> we didn't have any great moment. But you know who didn't scream? Me. Winning. <laughs> Hashtag blessed. <laughs> no, um, there's this. So the it takes the village. This is. A, a, please, I want to hear other thoughts on this, but this is also kind of connecting to the question. I found this irony of like it takes a village I, I grew up hearing that but where culture and religion kind of intersected with um family culture was this uh don't we don't wash our dirty laundry outside right so um there are things that I know people in my parents lives will never know about my parents children um but those people should know so so they could speak you know directly to those things but but we don't want to embarrass our family like you know we don't want to um we don't want to make our parents look weak or like they failed so i like i find that it takes a village is so so much easier said than done and it wasn't my experience i didn't see my parents being vulnerable um like i didn't and but but that was also their trauma response to not have to not being cared for well um like I was and I realized they're better as, at this as they're getting older because I was talking with them about this and my dad was like oh tell them like you know, the, um, for the podcast he was like tell them that we did not do a good job of, <laughs> of being vulnerable and being clear I was like well thank you for saying that but also you're in your 60s if you said that when you were in your 30s we wouldn't be here <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, but it takes it takes a village. So in my adulthood, now I have to think about what it takes a village really looks like, um, because there is that desire to for like self-preservation. Right. And you want to be you want to be a leader. You want to look dependable. You want to look faithful. You want to look like, you know, um, because you've obeyed God. Here's all the good things that you did and you know, <laughs> the things that you've gotten right that people can emulate. Um, so I don't know. I, I the, the idea of it takes a village really, I, I think it looks different across um, different familial uh, dynamics. 
the other thing I, I will add to though, um, this is in response to the question around parental dynamics is um, paying attention. And Dr. Michelle, you said this so well um, with giving power to emotions, um, but then the parent who is overly expressive and the parent who is underly expressive creates a child um, who knows that when the overly expressive parent is in their element, the I'm um, just their parent is not going to protect them, right? Because they're just, they're not trying to get in the way of the overly expressive parent. And so when you have this child who is developing in that environment, um, they could either fall into, you know, replicate both sides. So either grow up to continue to, um, to never express or to overexpress, or kind of like me where you just need the right trigger. <laughs> Um, to, you know, to, to fall back into that um, management mode, right? Because, you know, no one is going to come in to help protect you. And um, anyway, I, I'm hope, I hope I'm not rambling at this point, but um, the idea of that emotional management, I think is so important, but um, it becomes so difficult when you have two completely different styles of emotional expression and people who don't necessarily know how to navigate the other person's expression. Or the other uh, adults. That's that's quite deep, especially with the under um, expressive and over expressive. You think that would mathematically create a balance, but the um yeah, the issues with that. I think um Mr. Sariki had a question and a comment. Um Mr. Sariki is one of our um uh, wonderful, wonderful African um mom and grandma, and she's been on the podcast and I'm sure she has a lot of wise insights to like to share. Mr. Sariki, please you can go on and um unmute your mic and ask your question. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you, everyone. This is so productive, great conversation. And I could say, I could connect from with all of you, from Dr. Puri all the way to the uh, uh, psychologist and also the psychiatrist as well. I didn't want to show my face because I'm fixing my hair and I look so, you know, I'm, I'm twisting my hair. This is what I do. You know, I've been doing that for, by myself for over 20 years. But this conversation is so great and it's well needed within African immigrant community all over the diaspora, as well as people back home. Dr. Puri, you mentioned something about adverse childhood experience. I didn't know you focus your research on that, which I would love to have more conversation with you about that. I never knew about adverse childhood experience until I listened to a podcast put together by both white and African-American. When they initially created this uh, adverse childhood experience, it was based on white experience, not on diversity of people from different backgrounds, not even on African-American background. And I would love for you to just explain it a little bit for those who may not know about what adverse childhood experience is. Because, yes. yes, you know, let me, I, because I want to ask all the questions for each one of them so everybody will know what they have to answer. And I would love to, you know. So it yes. is great to have such, you know, understanding because we need more Africans to join in into this kind of research. Mm -hmm. To yes. know that uh -huh, we have to understand how do we design what is adverse childhood experience that is connected to our own cultural background, mm -hmm. our own experience, as Dr. Michelle said, growing up in an African community back home and expectation, you know, which a lot has to do with so many things that is rolling over my head. Mm -hmm. But um, Dr. Michelle, I really appreciate you mentioning parents' trauma. Because if parents are not understanding their own experience of what they experienced growing up, how does it affect their children? And I would love for you to expand a little bit more when it comes to, I know you based in your country, Malawi, I believe. How do how can parents carry that? to America or in the diaspora, anywhere they are, in terms of how it affect their children mm -hmm. in upbringing. And uh, for Dr. Adebayo, 
I really commend you regarding um psychiatric, you know, care. There's still a lot of um uh stigma attached to actually seeking psychiatric help within African immigrant community in the diaspora, as well as back home. When I first started the pod this podcast of Pansa Pansa, I interviewed a young lady who suffered from bipolar disorder in Nigeria. And uh, she now have her own organization about the stigma associated with mental health when she was going through it what she had to, our parents didn't understand what she was going through. So within African immigrants, how can we educate parents to normalize that it's okay if your child is taking psychotropic medication? The same way physical health is important, so is mental health. I always tell parents, your head is the source of your humanity. Is where your eyes located, your nose, your mouth, every aspect of your human being. You know, because deep down, even in Yoruba culture, they will say, Ori Lonishi, that means your head is the sense of your direction of your life. So how can we normalize this kind of conversation? So thank you all for, you know, and I'll, I'm going to speak to more Sibu. I think I could invite each one of you <laughs> so my go contact. ahead i can do the introduction I should have uh -huh. <laughs> so thank you so much thank you uh, thank you uh, uh, would you start thing. with um just dr Piri, jessica so expanding on adverse childhood experiences especially seeing how these measures preclude our um, experiences as africans maybe just explain what they are and some of the constructs they measure and how maybe having a parent in jail might not really be a problem but we could have in other issues as well but I think that would be a good way to get started. And then I will repeat um, Dr. Michelle's question and then also Dr. Yomide's question in case they, they forget by the time they're about to answer. Thank you. Ms. Sergey, it's so good to hear your voice. Um, thank you for that question. So to expand on it a bit, um, there are multiple articles, books written on this, so we can teach a whole class on it. So I'll just give a um, like the spark notes version. So we call them ACEs, so Adverse Childhood Experiences, but it would it became popularized in 96 when Kaiser Permanente in California partnered with uh, with Dr. Filetti to essentially try to understand people's, um, ad how, how adversity in early childhood was connected to ill physical health in adulthood. So it was a, what we call a retrospective study where you look at people with COPD, heart disease, and all kinds of asthma, like all kinds of conditions, uh, and trying to see if adversity outside of their physical health could have, connect, have been connected to it. And they found, um, or examples of an ACE would be growing up with uh, a mentally ill parent or growing up with an incarcerated parent or an alcoholic parent. Um, so again, you know, the, the parenting thing plays into this as well, or your primary guardian, basically the adult who was in charge of you in your early childhood. Um, and it was found that people, when people had more ACEs in their early childhood, they were more likely to have adverse physical health in their adulthood. Um, the, one of the major limitations with that original study from 96 was that um, most of the, like Ms. Seriki was alluding to, most of the, the participants were male, they were white, and they were of a uh, particular socioeconomic um, stand, um, level. And so the study has been replicated over and over again in multiple states in the U.S. and multiple parts of the world to expand on what ACEs could look like. So, for instance, um, Philadelphia added, um, if you... If you have been part of the foster care system, that counts as an ACE. If you've witnessed violence, um, if you've been bullied, that counts as an ACE. Um, I will say though, specifically with ACEs, they need to be context specific, right? Because um, some kids will grow up hearing gunshots, even if they were never shot themselves, that is an experience of trauma. You know, it's extremely valid. Um, what I'm yet to see, and if I had bandwidth for this, I would do it, is um, examining ACEs among boarding school students in different parts of the world. As I went to boarding school, and I when I tell you, we were surrounded by um, uh, the P words, by pedophiles, <laughs> and we were surrounded by multiple adults who were not well regulated, but we spent six years of our lives in on, living on campus with them nine months of the year, every year for six years. There are multiple ACEs that will come out of that. 
um, that that kids within the same country that went to day school would not experience, right? So um, while ACEs are widely discussed, I think we miss out on a lot because we don't go as uh, context specific as we should. Uh, but that's a very quick spark notes version, <laughs> version of ACEs. And we can, I know we can keep talking about it for a while. Thank you so much. Um, for Dr. Michelle, so your question was about parents in diaspora. So mm -hmm. if you're able to answer that, yeah. Um, yes. So um, I'm also thinking of immigrating, migrating at some point. So I also know that I will carry my fears of the new environment because um, we're talking about parenting in the African setting. We have a different social cultural makeup altogether. So wherever you go, there'll also be a different social cultural makeup that will trigger you. So I'll give an example. You, you, you know, let's say the UK drinking for 18 year olds, 19 year olds is normal. Dressing in, uh, I don't know, something as short as they, as they want to. Exploring sexuality in ways that are quite, um, not it are quite different from the way as Africans express their sexuality, even religious freedom. So, um, it's now that okay, you've left one environment, you also be confronted with a different type of things that you know trigger you differently. The fears that you may have had in Africa, like oh, my son or daughter want to get the best education, may not exist in you know, the developing world, but now you have all these different fears. Um, is my child going to be religious? So I think for me as parents, we constantly have to adapt to our children's needs, emotional needs, intellectual needs, um, social needs, um, in the role that is supportive as opposed to confrontational. So I'll explain that. Confrontational means you know, imposing things that you think should be in a certain way. While supportive means, um, you know, making sure that you're putting their well-being in the front. So easier said than done. I'm also an African parent. So, but at least when you think about that, another thing is connection. I think whatever phase your child is, if you maintain that connection, um, because I've dealt with adolescents where, um, it, it's very different where you have an adolescent or a child who is experiencing challenges, but they're still connected to their parents. You're, you're, you're better off arguing with your child, screaming at, at, at each other than just having that child who has just completely shut down. They go to their room, they've lost their trust. They can't tell you how they feel. So I think to me, the connection is important that what, at, at whatever point, uh, you know, maintaining that connection that at least you can still talk. And yeah, it's, it's a continuous process because we are also adapting to a new environment. We've lost our social support once we move into the diaspora, even our status. You know, here, I can assure you, this cup of tea was not made by me. <laughs> so I'll find myself having to do stuff for myself. Your status in the society changes. So that's another layer of changes or trauma that you, you're having to deal with. So... As a, a psychologist, I think I, personal growth is lifelong. If you're going to live up to 80 or 90, you will still be growing with every challenge that comes. I'll give an example, which I think most of you will identify with. Um, I'm not a fan of the royal family, but I indulge in it for entertainment and they wear very nice clothes. So, you know, towards the end of, of uh, her death, the queen, I mean, she, she, she had a lot of experiences, but the challenge that, you know, the Harry and Meghan issue brought was very different, you know? So there is no point in life where I think you'd say, you know what, I'm wise, I've grown, anything can come. So at that point in her 80s, she had to learn to deal with that family dynamic. So what do I do with my grandchild uh, uh, who is experiencing this? So if you also approach uh, it parenting in that way or life in that way to say it's lifelong growth, we'll have different lived experience at every phase in our life and just be adaptable. 
Thank you so much. Um, and last but not least for um, Dr. Emilia, we also have like a couple of questions that we'll take right after her. Um, from Mr. Tariki will be um, mental health stigma, especially among African diasporas. How do we equip ourselves to be more open to admitting that my child might need to be, or I might need to be on medications for um, depression or bipolar or schizophrenia. How do we break down that stigma and equip parents, especially in the diaspora? Sorry, is that two questions? It's, I think it's one question. It's just the stigma, mental health stigma around um, psychotropic medications and especially for those in the diaspora right. that have African this, descent. Yeah, this is, this is, this is something I, I think about quite a bit because it's it is well known it is quite well known that um uh minorities and actually i don't think it's just diaspora and minorities i think it's also just like black americans black british people um um who are historically sort of british or american um have a historically lower rate of i mean um so, uh, motorani you you've you've ex you've explored this in some of your research and I, I think yeah haven't you just the yes, low yes. health seeking Mm -hmm. rates even for physical health problems mm -hmm. right before you can get to yeah it's everywhere yeah. yeah yeah before you even get to psychiatry like even for physical health problems there's already a sort of reduction in low health seeking in health and it's different you know in the uk you can probably attribute it to socioeconomic factors in the uk and in the us i mean in the uk where healthcare is free in the nhs you know it's like okay that's you can't just say socioeconomic factors right so some of it is just about sort of cultural ideas as well as suspiciousness of, of the healthcare system and all of that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a big problem. Um, how to fix it is a trickier question because it's something that is just sort of being acknowledged and 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 starting to be looked into. Um, I think I think. At a personal level, which I suppose is the level we can, you know, I mean, like, I, I don't think there's much value here in going into like the policy level. Um, but at a personal level, what we can do is just for the people around us that we know and care about, just sort of having these conversations with them, um, talking to them. I think something I found very helpful is sharing our own experiences of seeking mental health care. Um, so I'm quite hope open about the fact that I've, you know. I've had therapy and and that sort of thing. Um, and I find that that's really helpful for people. Sometimes you just saying that is enough to get them thinking. Um, especially if you have a good enough relationship with them, you know, to think, oh, well, if this person, who I know and hopefully have some respect for, um, has done this, um, then you know maybe it's not something out of scope for me to do. Um. So yeah, some of it is just talking about our experiences, talking about what it's like, um, pushing back on on sort of the negative ideas when they come up um, is probably also helpful. Um, and then just having an honest chat about like um, mental health, um, just like, you know, not when I say mental health now, not just like psychiatric issues, but just like emotions and and feelings and, and all that sort of thing. Um, and normalizing emotional reactions to things like you know grief um although to some extent i would say to be honest i feel like that's something we do quite well actually um i don't know about in the uk in the us but in the uk it, there can be quite a bit of you know reluctance to express emotion that i think for us is quite normal um even where we feel like and like again that's not to say that in aren't ways we can't do better actually i feel like we we kind of do that like culturally we're quite good at actually creating space for things like mourning and things like that um in ways that are not as common here um so i think I, another aspect is just sort of looking at what can we learn and also what can we bring to the cultures we find ourselves in um and sort of thinking about it from that angle because we do have things to bring as well um and to offer and to share um yeah i think that's i don't know if that's helpful but yeah no, I think it's very helpful because um, it starts, I think for this to be more of a um, bottom up approach, we can talk about policies from now, but you doing that comparing of the um, healthcare infrastructure in the US and the UK, even with um, in places where in the US, we still have a little bit of the NHS, um, NHS model, NHS model, sorry, with the veterans and those that are Medicaid, we still find that uh, we, you find a lot of blacks and minorities still not seeking those 
free services. So it's got to be more than just not the availability of it. There's just some personal contextual factors. And spot on, on using ourselves as an example, I've been very vocal on the pod, on this podcast. I've even had a conversation with Ayamidi on it. I've been on therapy since maybe I'm up, coming up on my 10th anniversary as a ther- with my therapist, and then which has really been very good for me as an immigrant moving here and just seeing some of the things popping out. I've also been on meds for anxiety and depression. Um, I stopped using it um, because of memory issues, but it really helped me when it did. And so um, being normalizing that and just saying, even going going on meds was a big issue for me because I had a lot of questions about how is it going to destroy my, my neural pathway. And I've had this conversation with every day and it just came down to if you're asthmatic, you won't be questioning you getting addicted to your asthma inhaler. Why should it be any different uh, for you know taking medication if your brain is broken? And so um, here's just the um, support. You can, it's okay to say you're not okay, but seek that level of help you need. If you have to be on meds, um, do your due diligence on the side effect and what is it gonna profit you? How long do you have to be on it for? But all that to say, it's okay if you need to get on meds or do therapy and medications or just therapy alone or medications, whatever works for you. And don't think therapy is a cop out. You guys have no idea how much unpacking you have to do. It's a lot of work to expose yourself to someone and hoping that they're on the other side to like, you know, scoop you up and, and help you with that. Um, down to our very, one of our very last questions will be from, um, the wonderful country of Zambia, and this is one of my um, podcast sisters, um, um, Chulu Chansa. She wants to ask about how parents can be um, well equipped with working with the teacher, the school units in um, um, basically building relationships to avoid um, suicide in the kids. So how do we partner up with teachers to help our children not be suicidal? So that parents teacher connection, how do we do that? And I will toss it up to any of the panelists to answer. I'll, I'd like to speak to that, but okay. also throw in faith communities as well. Um, and maybe especially actually, um, for, I mean, obviously where, where people have faith practice and if you're not, then that's, you know, you can look for other social avenues, but other social sort of third places. Um, in terms of partnering with schools, um, I think I think lots of teachers are trained in these sorts of things, um, including even in like back home as well. Obviously, probably that's probably done better in the West, um, but I know that in Nigeria and a lot of African countries, that's starting to be a thing that people are becoming more and more aware of. Um, obviously, they also have other challenges, including the fact that they probably have like five more five times more students, and so just practically, it's just going to be harder period um if you have 50 students versus if you have 15 um to sort of look at their mental health and you know i can't really blame anybody who struggles with with the bigger number um but you know but i think people are trying i i I think a good part of it is just the basics that i think parents have always done which is have as good relationship as you can with your kids teachers um know your kids friends where you can um because and have conversations with them um, I know, I know. A friend of mine found out that her, you know, um, her 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 son was having some quite dark thoughts um, through a friend of the son's who came to this this parent and said, "Look, um, he's not talking to me, and uh, something's going on." <laughs> you know, um, um, and this again goes back to the community thing, right? So it was the friend, and this was a school friend, uh, which is why I'm bringing that up here. It was the friend who was able to sort of spot it. But then the friend knew the parents enough. And again, that tells you a lot of what work has gone on in the background to feel comfortable to say, I'm going to talk to this guy's mom because I'm not be able to talk, to, I'm not able to talk to the guy. Um so it's stuff like that. Um, but the reason why I would highlight other communities, um, whether that's social clubs, whether that's you know, religious um, faith communities, is there's something I think about um when people aren't being paid to do this. So for teachers, that's their job. They're paid. And God bless them. They're, 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 it's not that the being paid makes them do a worse job, but it's it, once you're paid, it becomes a professional relationship. So an example I think about often is if I have a young person at my job who is, you know, struggling, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to hug them. Because Without that's getting just... fired. <laughs> That's not how that relationship you can, works. You can right? hug. It's just <laughs> no, but I no, but like I can't actually. I know. I know. I know, well, I, know. I mean, 
that happened once or twice when like a patient hugged me and I allowed it. But it's something you 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 sort of think very carefully. And it would never be an opposite sex patient. Like just that one, that one's completely off the table. Like we're even talking like even for the same sex patients, it's it's you have to really think about it. And it's mostly not gonna happen. And I was thinking about the fact that, but if it was like a kid at church, straight up, like it's not even a consideration. You know, again, I would probably not for the opposite sex case, but for like one of the boys, like, you know, and they're struggling. And I've done that so many times. And remember the day I had this thought was one day when one boy was particularly struggling, I just went around him and sort of held him around the shoulder um, while he was crying. I was like, are you okay? Do you want to talk? And I was just thinking about, I couldn't do this at work. <laughs> right. And th this is the limitation of, of those professional relationships, not because those people don't want to do it. Because in, in my case, I'm the same person. But when you're being paid, it's just a, there's a difference in that relationship because now it's professional and it can be personal in that way. Whereas in those other settings, they can be personal in a way that you can't be in those sort of more professional relationships. Um, and I think that's also because I think there's a tendency to sort of hyper focus on schools and forget the value of these third spaces um, um, where you can have more personal relationships with, with um, young people. And again, that can allow for a level of connection. Now, obviously, we whatever the context, whether it's school or whatever, there's always risk. And I think people get worried a lot about, you know, oh, grooming and all of this. And those are real. Um, I think the problem, though, is you don't hear all the times that these relationships go really well. And I think all of us would probably have had these experiences with older adults when we're younger that were really helpful. But people don't talk about it because it just, there's nothing to talk about. So you, Negative you only bias, get, yeah. The bad yeah, ones, so yeah. there's that exactly there's that bias of like when it goes wrong, you hear those stories and everybody is thinking about that all the time, and so there are people who generally will not let their kids interact with anybody else. And I get I get the fear because obviously you know you're the parent, um, but but the truth is it goes right so many times, but there's nothing to talk about, so it doesn't make the news. You know, like, like someone said, dog bites man is not news. It's when is man bites dog. <laughs> <laughs> that you have the news right so you know nobody talks about all the times the other it, nothing happens because nothing happened you know it was just a kid with an adult and things went well and the kid was getting mentorship and all of that um so i think those third spaces are really important to think about is is all i'm saying thank you well. thank you so much and it's funny how we kind of know how to behave in so like professional and personal settings but it's like the first time I'm actually, you know, visualizing like, yeah, I can't hug a student, but if that student of the same age was in my church, I could give them a hug and not think twice about it. But it's the same, you know, age demographic. But I, I love that um, advice of diversifying our communities. And um, it's, we started with talking about mental health, but we ended up talking about community. And it's just a running joke between our media and I, Shelly, when it comes on the podcast, that we you can't just do life alone. You have to find a way to make sure that you are in community. And whatever that might look like for you, whether it's through religious organizations or that shared interest, do that. And that's one model that I'm trying to give my daughter um, to understand the power of community. So she's very much immersed in that. She knows that we want to self-made people we have had people, you know, show us love and we reciprocate that. That's how we relieve life. My final question for all of you will be this. We're seeing a lot of people, um, our, our, our community, African communities, we're so good on that, you know, um, transgenerational sharing of wisdom, but that's becoming more fragmented. My, uh, and I think a stark reminder of that for me was I lost my last living grandparent um, last year and I couldn't even make it home for the burial. And um, I hadn't seen her before then in a decade. We talked once in a while on the phone, but the way she would talk to me and address me, it felt very distant for me. I mean, I, she would call me my pet name, which I hadn't, no one ever calls me that. She was the only one who would call me that. But the more I was away from home, the more it felt very distant talking to this person. It wasn't quite as warm on my end, but she would, uh, but it evoked some form of responses for me. And uh, then she eventually passed away. And that was my last surviving um, grandparent. And you're seeing that happening, even with parents sending their you know, words abroad to go study. And you're seeing that fragment, um, the family unit just getting more fragmented. And that also impacts communication and sharing down values. How do we ensure we still stay intact, even when we're so far away? You know, um, that would be my final challenging question to all of the panelists. That's a challenge. <clears throat> I think, as much as we want to remain intact, um, 
I, I think of family, like, so, you know, the image of the family tree, um, well, view, typically the family tree is like trying to figure out who, how everyone is related. But um, if we made an analogy with the actual tree, it starts with the roots, right? The heritage where every where we're collecting everything. And then you have the branch that's kind of the core identity with it. I'm sorry, the trunk, that's the core identity. But then you have branches, right? So everyone, and the branches are the farthest from the root and they um, go in different directions. Um, but they're still they're still connected to the roots somehow. Um, but grafting happens, right? Sometimes you like cut off a part of a branch and you put it into another um, into another tree, and it's it still thrives, right? Um, so all that to say, like there's there should be safety and there should be normal conversation around chosen family and like um, the way that values can change, and that's not a bad thing. Um, and it like I because well I I will speak from my experience. Sometimes I'm shamed for not um, speaking Hausa as much or not knowing my parents' tribal language. Um, but there are things that my chosen family here have given me that my roots haven't. So like safety and expressing my emotions and you know and, and mental health and finding values that um, that I want to replicate that I otherwise would not have developed if I wasn't around my chosen family. So. Um, there is there is a lot to grieve in um, not having that kind of intact tree pre-grafting, um, but I think it's healthy to grieve that and acknowledge it and still know that um, while that's there, chosen family is just as valuable, you know, um, and, and like the disconnect happens when we don't allow ourselves grieve what could have been if we didn't migrate, you know. For that analogy with um the roots and the branches and just the role to play. Thank you so much. Um, I am again you want to expand on that. No, I just I love that. I love that. I love the idea of you know allowing ourselves mourning. Um, I love it because also it's a, you know it's like a little pun of also allowing yourself to mourn, but also allowing yourself to wait for the morning, right? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, roll your eyes. <laughs> But yeah, um, but it's it's yeah that that's really important. I think it's it's the recognition that family can, you know, again, if if we're thinking in terms of community, like, you know, yes, let's be grateful for the communities we leave behind, um, but let's also be open to the communities that are waiting for us where we are, um, and 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 acknowledge, you know, I like so someone, you know, one of my uncles when I was younger used to say to me that, um. You know, there's this Yoruba proverb, which, you know, like 20 children cannot play together for 20 years, you know, and it's sort of just this idea that life is in seasons, like people will come and people will go and it's okay, right? Like, it's okay. And some people will not go. But I think it's sort of, I think the way I've come to think about it is that apart from like the closest family, there's an aspect to life where we allow ourselves to see who's what rather than determining beforehand this person will never go and yeah we can determine that for some people because we're like, okay this person is special enough that they will never go um and i will always try and hold on to this relationship as much as i can but even then you still have to give yourself the space to allow the relationship to evolve in 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 in, in its different ways um but also technology right like I'm so glad for the times we live in. Like the fact that we can even have this conversation. Um, imagine trying to set this up 20 years ago, right? Like it's not like it would have been impossible, but it would have needed a lot more tech support, right? Um, and 40, 50 years ago, it would have to have been like a very expensive conference call um, and even more tech support. And now it's just free. <laughs> I mean, you're paying your internet bill, but you're going to pay that anyway, so it doesn't really count. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So um it's 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 I, I think it's amazing that we get to do this, you know, like you know, when a time when you can talk to your family back home every day, every week, and you're not looking at your call credit and so okay, I'm gonna call them for two minutes. I still remember growing up and like, you know, like you call people abroad and you'd be like, look, you have two minutes, think about what you're gonna say very carefully, right? Because and then you, you know, but now you can just chat to somebody for like an hour or two hours and just start about nonsense. Um, and, and that's amazing. You know, we often talk about like, it's beautiful to have face-to-face -face, and it is, um, but you know, what's great when you can't have face-to-face -face? 
it's technology. Um, and, and that's amazing. So like let's let's make the most of that. Let's let's, you know, one of the things I've tried to do, a friend of mine advised this is for my niece and nephew back in Nigeria. Um, so yeah, this might be a good idea actually. I got this idea from a friend. It's just one of the most creative people I know. I don't know where she till she came up with this idea by herself. Um, and I, and I feel like I've really hyped it. And it was basically like every now and then I will send my niece and nephew pictures from my day-to-day life. Not pictures of myself, just like random silliness that I see around me where I am. And then every now and then when I've sent them like enough of those pictures, they will call me and they will ask me about the pictures. They will ask you about, okay, what's happening in that picture? What were you doing? What is going on? And it's sort of this idea of like, you know, I'm like uncle, I'm middle over up in the UK, but... I'm a real presence for them. Like, like hopefully they grew up and they remember that they had this uncle used to send like weird pictures, <laughs> right? And, and it was something that they were very excited. So like every, every now and then I'll forget and I'll, you know, I'll get busy. And then like the mom will be texting me. That's, you know, like my sister-in-law, like uh, when we need more pictures, man. <laughs> what's up? What's up with them pictures? <laughs> you know, and it's like, it's not her asking. It's the kids asking <laughs> and saying, well, where's Uncle I mean, these pictures? We need pictures. <laughs> And that's the moment I realized, oh my goodness, they're actually waiting for this now. This is like a thing, you know. Um, and so yeah, God knows what other ideas people could come up with. So there's there's all sorts of little ways. And again, that's technology, right? Because now we have these cameras in our pockets that can take really amazing, sort of high quality photos and videos, um, compared to the grainy stuff from when we were growing up, <laughs> you know. Um, so yeah, I think thinking about how we can creatively use technology is a wonderful way we can try and sustain these connections across distances as well. Thank you so much for that. Um, um, Dr. Michelle, you want to add anything to? Uh, not much. Um, just to uh, say that um, just finding ways to compensate for the feeling of isolation and loss of identity. And uh, as uh, Dr. Ayomide and uh, Dr. Puri say, um, it's really just appreciating where you come from and uh, making the best of where you are because uh, we all leave our homes for a reason and uh, it's not a decision that you make um, impulsively. So yes, just finding a way to feel the curving a new identity. I mean, I'm blessed. I, I feel blessed. I've literally found a new community here, something that I never expected, you know? So it's the same thing um, just find a way to deal with the isolation, compensating, um, finding different ways to connect. And I, I like the idea of finding a new family, as, as Dr. Piri put it, um, finding family in others. And family doesn't have to be, you know, blood family, but anyone who embraces you, who makes you feel welcome and, you know, puts you in a place where, you know, you're thriving. That's family to me. Thank you so much. Uh, we have talked a lot today. Uh, unfortunately, our time is very well spent, but I will, um, if you follow the multiple podcast, um, also find out our YouTube channel on YouTube and Instagram at the multiple podcast. We will be putting just a um, summary of this episode. And um, also, if you'd like to get in touch with me or any of the panelists, you can just email me at talk to more at mosable.com and I'll be more than happy to introduce you to any of the panelists. Or um, for those that are publicly available, you guys just share your Instagram handles or um, email addresses. I can start with um, Dr. Yomide. I know you're very, you're out there, <laughs> you're outside. <laughs> um, yeah, oh, okay, yeah, My mine is, um, you know, at X now, we have to call it X, don't we? <laughs> Sounds like a drug. <laughs> It's, 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 I, I was going to say it sounds like something inappropriate. <laughs> um, but yes, I'm I'm at Doc Ayomide on on the X app, um, and also on Threads. If you're if you're into that, I don't know if people are into that yet. Um, but yeah, um, and hello at docayomide.com if you want to send me an email. Um, join docayomide.com for my newsletter. Yeah. And mine is <clears throat> matero michelle at gmail.com. I am very old school, <laughs> so I'm not a very uh, social media person, but on Instagram, mate-michelle2021. 
but on LinkedIn, I'm very much there most of the time, and you can message me on LinkedIn as well. Got it. Thank you so much. And I'll put it down the show notes. Um, Dr. Piri. Yeah, Michelle, I'm right there with you. I you can reach me on email. <laughs> you email me. <laughs> Just find me on LinkedIn. Well, my email is jessica.puri at northwestern.edu. Um, or LinkedIn is just my full name, Jessica Puri, PhD, MPH. Fun fact, I am the only black Jessica Puri. All the others are Indian. So I will you will see my black face <laughs> there. You that is true. Puri is like that's yeah. an yeah. No, I'm so yeah. curious where your yeah. surname comes from. Yeah. No idea. Yeah. I have no yeah. idea. Our yeah. clan name, I think, is like me Puri, and my family decided to keep it. Um, but like it's actually like there's a town in India called Jagannath Puri. There's a kind of bread called Puri. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. there's like no Puris actually, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. so they're every normally, time they're normally not Kamsa. Yeah, I like, they, I show up and they're like, huh. I'm like, yeah. And then they know I'm married, and so they see my husband, who's a beautiful tall black man whose last name is Buckley, and they're like, Well, you're not so where is Puri from? <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, but and, <laughs> and the person who introduced me to you was Indian as well. So I thought you were Indian when they were talking about. Right? I was like, she had to be Indian, and I was like, Wait, what? Is she like, oh, all yeah. black looking Indian? Um. Anyways, so uh, thank you all so much. I, I mean, this this has just been a hearty conversation, and spot on on what Dr. Michelle said. This is community right here, and we hope that you all take this with you and start making your life happen for you and not living life alone. Um, as a roundup, I just wanted to highlight one of the big things we're doing on the podcast. We're raising funds for women who have been challenged with fertility issues. We're raising um, $10,000 to provide not just financial aid, but peer mentoring and support, emotional support services. Every contribution goes a long way. If you like to donate your services or your time or money, I'm putting the link on the show, uh, on the, the chat. And then um, as we just go, I just want to add that this um, preventing suicide in, in those we love, it involves not just our own effort, but we need to be in community for that to happen, right? So what are things I'm going to leave you with based on what our wonderful panelists said, challenging the not my kid mindset, mindsets, watch out for cues. I know in this part of the world where we're so burdened with our nine to five and five to nine work, sometimes we're blindsided on how our kids are just growing, you know, without and outside of us, but challenging that on my kid um, mentality, having conversations, checking in on them about their emotions, labeling the emotions, creating that diverse support systems, right? Embracing the communities of the past and present, um, understanding what your own limitations are, grow emotionally with your child, foster those very support network, cultivate emotional awareness, um, be mindful as parents. It's okay, you're heavily flawed, that's okay. Your kids will become heavy, heavily flawed parents, but that shouldn't stop the buck, you know, seek help if you need, be on med if you have to be on med, um, recognize just the cultural impacts of mental health, the baggage you bring with you, especially if you're moving across countries, address those unresolved traumas, seek support, and start opening those dialogues. Um, I am short shared about that book, How to Talk So Kids Will Listen, and Listen So Kids Will Talk. That's a very good resource, and it was published in 1980, so you know it's going to be a good book, right? In any event, um, this has been a production from the Mossable Podcast. We have conversations like this. As a matter of fact, this topic was inspired by, you know, Jessica, who was a guest. So if there are other ways we can serve you as a community, please let us know. We take those comments very, very seriously. And we promise to um, populate those voices by bringing in people who would be able to speak to those topics. So reach out to us on email talk to more at mossable.com or follow us on Instagram at the Mossable Podcast. I'm so thankful for each of you for joining us on this Saturday morning, afternoon, evening, whatever part of the world you're in. And um, a great weekend to you and happy Thanksgiving if you celebrate that or not, or Kwanzaa, Christmas, New Year, just, you know, please stay safe. I remember you really matter. And thank you all so much. Bye bye everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this, Mo. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so Thank you. Thank you. I'll check in with uh, you good all. To, good, to, good to be on a call again, Jessica. It's been it's been a while. I know. Oh, yes. I know. I know. <laughs> I feel like we can hang out for a while. I like never run out yes. of talk about. Yes.